Okay, here we are with our multivariable lesson about centroids of curves and plane regions, section 6.6 .6 in your textbook. And basically, the center or centroid of a region is the balancing point. From Wikipedia, in mathematics and physics, the centroid or geometric center of a two dimensional region is informally the point at which a cardboard cutout of the region could be perfectly balanced on the tip of a pencil, assuming uniform density and a uniform gravitational field. Formally, the centroid of a plane figure or two-dimensional shape is the arithmetic mean or average position of all the points in the shape. The definition extends to any object in n-dimensional space. Its centroid is the mean position of all the points in all of the coordinate directions. Now for a triangle, of course, we have a theorem that shows if you bisect the sides, then the uh, line segments joining um, the midpoint of each side to the opposite angle, those segments will meet at the centroid. So here we have sort of an odd-shaped fellow, and uh, supposedly that point right there would be where a pencil would uh, balance it perfectly, and that would be the centroid. And later on in this course, we're going to look at uh, three-dimensional objects and find the centroid or center point of three-dimensional objects, but that's later. Note, when an object has constant density, the centroid and the center of mass are equivalent. Now, if, it, if an object does not have constant density, then the center of mass will move towards the densest um, area, and so that's a topic for another day. Law of the lever. All right, so here we have like a seesaw, and there's a heavier object on the right than on the left, and in order to balance the seesaw at the middle, which is kind of like the centroid, we have to place the heavier object nearer to the balancing point. And in fact, uh, we know from physics that if we multiply each mass times the distance to the balancing point or centroid, we get the same product. So using that idea, what if you have several weights? Well, then the sum of the masses times the distances on the left should equal the sum of the masses and the distances on the right. So if we extend this to like the Cartesian plane and think of a mass value at each x value, then the total mass is you just add up all those masses, right? And then the idea here is that the total mass times the balancing x bar, the one that's in the middle uh, of all this, will equal the sum of all the separate masses times the x values. And so that's how we define x bar. Now if we include a position for the mass that also has a y coordinate, then the same idea applies to y. And so the, mad, the total mass uh, times the average y position is going to equal the sum of all the individual masses times the individual y positions. And so the, the total mass times the um, average x value or the centroid x value is called the moment about the y axis because you're finding the average x, so you're like going around the y axis. And then m y bar um, is called a moment about the x axis because the average y is, is somewhere around the x axis. And then the center of mass is x bar y bar, and if we have a constant density, then x bar y bar is also the centroid. Now we're going to talk about laminas and centroids of plane regions. A lamina is a two-dimensional planar closed surface with mass and density, and in this section we're only going to look at laminas with constant density. Variable density will be covered later in the course. So let's say we have a lamina shape, shaped like a circle. Then pretty obviously the center of the circle is the centroid. The centroid is at the center of the circle. Let's say we have a sort of a petal-shaped um, lamina that has a line of symmetry. If there is a line of symmetry, then the centroid will lie on that line of symmetry. Now because it's a little fatter at the top than at the bottom, 
the centroid will move a little bit towards the fatter end of the lamina. Centroids of plane regions continued. Let's say our lamina is bounded by a function f of x on the x-axis from a to b. And with that loss of generality, we can just call the density one unit, so we don't have to worry about the weight of that particular lamina. In that case, the mass would be equal to the area, which is given by the integral from a to b of f of x dx. Now, if uh, we wanted to do the moment about the y-axis, um, if we did a Riemann sum, then we could do it the way we always did, and just multiply the mi's times the xi's. And so, um, the moment of this region about the y-axis can be thought of as the total mass, which is a times x bar, or the limit of the Riemann sum where we multiply all the mi's times the xi's. Um, that would give us the discrete values, but then if, since it's a continuous area, we would take the limit as n goes to infinity and be getting that value at each and every x. Now furthermore, um, mi the area of that uh, rectangle is the change in x times function value. That's just the mass of that little rectangle that's approximating um, the actual mass. And so we're going to uh, substitute that for mi in our, in our uh, expression down here. And so we get um, the change in x times f of x for m, and then x is just x. And so that morphs into the integral from a to b of x f of x dx. So the moment about the y-axis is given by that integral. And then if we want x bar, we just divide by the area. Now similarly, only a little bit different, for the y's, um, it's a little bit different because the average y is going to be, um, if we do a Riemann sum, it's going to be in the middle of each rectangle. And so that's a half yi. For instead of xi, we're going to use a half yi. And so our moment around the x-axis for the region can be given by the total mass a times the average y, or we can sum mi times a half yi. And then again, we can substitute for mi what we did before, the change in x times the function value. And notice that yi is also uh, equal to f of xi. And so what we end up with is f of xi times itself times the change in i. And then, of course, we have the 1 half there So when we substitute. And so that morphs into the integral from a to b of a half f of x squared dx. And again, if we want y bar, the average y uh, value, which would be um, the second coordinate of the centroid, we would just divide that integral by a. So let's look at number 6 from your textbook. Find the centroid of the plane region bounded by y equals 0, y equals x, and x plus y equals 2. So the first step is to draw a picture. And you can probably intuit that uh, x bar is going to be 1, right in the middle of the triangle, and that y bar will be closer to the bottom of the triangle than the top, so, you know, less than a half. So the moment around the y axis for r is uh, can be uh, computed two ways. The area, which is the total mass times x bar average x, or by the integral from a to b of x f of x dx. So let's uh, compute a first. Now notice that we have to use uh, two different integrals because a is bounded by, the area is bounded by two different functions. So from 0 to 1 we're using x, and then from 1 to 2 we're using the other line, which is uh, y equal 2 minus x. That comes out to the following antiderivatives, and when you do the arithmetic, you get 1. Well, that's handy because um, in our equation above in yellow, we can just use 1 for a, and so we can compute x bar immediately without doing any dividing. So again, we need two integrals. The first integral, we're going to multiply x times uh, f of x, which is x, and then in the second integral, the second half of the triangle, we're multiplying x times a different function, 2 minus x. And there are the antiderivatives, and when you do the arithmetic, you get 1, which is what we expected for x bar, right? All right, so now let's look at the formula for the moment around the x-axis of the region, which is the area, total area times y bar, or also the integral from a to b of a half f of x squared. And so again, we're going to need two integrals in our computation. And since a is 1, we can just go straight to uh, figuring out what y bar is. 
first integrals from 0 to 1, a half of x squared, and then moving along to the second line, um, our integral is from 1 to 2, a half the quantity 2 minus x squared. And I didn't show the antiderivative because I was running out of space, but when you do the antiderivative and evaluate, you get 1 third which is kind of what we expected. We wanted it to closer to the bottom of the triangle than the top. So there's our centroid at 1 comma 1 third. Now we're going to have to look at centroids of plane regions a little further because up until now we've just had one function. What if we have two functions bounding our uh, region? f of x on top oh, and g of x on the bottom. Yeah. All right, so now if we look at a Riemann sum, mi is the difference between the two function values times the change in x. And so our moment around the y-axis is a times x bar again, and we still have the Riemann sum, but this time when we um, substitute for mi, we have f of x minus g of x, and so that morphs into the integral x for xi, and then for mi, we've got the difference between the two functions times the change in x. Now for y bar, when we're doing uh, the moment around the x-axis, uh, yi is going to be a half, the, it's going to be the average of the two values, and so we're going to take one half um, f of xi plus g of xi, because we're averaging those two values to get the middle point for the y value. So for the moment around the x-axis of r, we want a times y bar to equal the limit of the Riemann sum mi times yi's all added up. But what are we going to get? Well, the mi's are going to have an f minus g in them, and the yi's have an f plus g in them. So what do we get when we multiply those two things together? Well, we get f squared minus g squared. And then of course we also have a half and uh, we also have the change in x. So we end up with one half f squared minus g squared dx for our integral. Number eight, find the centroid of the plane region bounded by y equal x squared and y equal nine. So here's the picture. And for the um, area, I just took the right half there from 0 to 3 and doubled it. And so we get mass equals area equals twice the integral from 0 to 3 of the top function a 9 minus the bottom function x squared, and that comes out to 36. And then by symmetry, I think we're going to know that x bar is 0, but let's do the math anyway. The area times x bar is equal to the integral of x times the difference between f and g. And so we get 36 x bar is integral from negative 3 to 3 x times 9 minus x squared. And you can see that because um, uh, x is going to be negative for the first half and positive for the second half, that that's going to come out to 0. If you like, you can go ahead and multiply that out and do the antiderivative and get 0 that way. Okay, and then for y bar, we have the area times y bar equals a half the integral of a half times f of x squared minus g of x squared. And so if I just go ahead and divide by the area, uh, combining that with the one half, y bar is going to be 1 over 72 times integral from negative 3 to 3 of just f of x squared minus g of x squared. And if you work that out, you get 5.4. So our centroid is at 0, 5.4, and we're not surprised that the y value is past the halfway point of 4.5 because there's more uh, mass at the top of the region than at the bottom. Number 16, find the centroid of the plane region bounded by y equal x squared and y, equal, and y squared equal x, which is the same as y equals square root of x. So there's our picture. Now, we know that the, uh, by, because there's a line of symmetry there, that the uh, centroid should be on that line of symmetry. And so x, since that line is uh, y equal x, we know that x bar is going to equal y bar. Now you might think, well, it's going to be exactly in the middle, but let's see if that's true. So the mass is just the area, which is from 0 to 1, the difference, uh, the top functions root x, the bottom functions x squared, and that comes out to 1 third. And again, I'm not, not showing the antiderivatives because I know you can do that. And so for ax bar, there's the formula. 
And so instead of uh, multiplying three times x bar, I divided both sides. Uh, instead of multiplying one third times x bar, I divided both sides by one third. So we get three times integral from zero to one of x times root x minus x squared. And again, I didn't I didn't work that out for you, but it is uh, comes out to nine twentieths. And for um, y bar we have this formula and we know it's going to be 9 twentieths but let's let's do the math anyway so again instead of putting the one-third on the left I just uh, put a 3 on the right so we get 3 halves times the integral from 0 to 1 of f squared minus g squared and again I didn't show the antiderivative but you can do that fairly easily and that does also come out to 9 twentieths so the centroid is 9 twentieths comma 9 twentieths. Now you might be surprised that that's a little bit lower than the halfway point along the symmetry line. Believe it or don't, this region is a little bit wider near 0, 0 than it is near 1, 1. First theorem of Pappus. Let R be a region in the plane rotated about an axis such that R does not intersect said axis. The volume of the solid generated equals the product of the area of R and the distance traveled by the centroid of R. In other words, the volume V equals the area of the region A times the distance traveled by the centroid. V equals AD. Uh, here's why that's true. Here's a picture of a region being rotated around the Y axis. and um, y uh, in a particular any particular place x bar is there and y bar is right in the middle of the region and so what we have here is the distance traveled by x bar um, is just 2 pi x bar because x bar is the uh, radius of that particular uh, region going around furthermore the volume by the shell method by of uh, shells that you've just studied lately is 2 pi times integral x times the difference between f and g. Well, look at there. That looks familiar. That is also the formula for the moment about the y-axis. In other words, that's that integral is equal to a x bar. So now we have the volume equaling 2 pi times a x bar. And if you look up above, 2 pi x bar is d. And so if you rearrange it, you've got A times D. Number 20. Use the first theorem of Pappus to find the centroid of the first quadrant region of the disk x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to r squared. So the first quadrant there is in blue. And we're going to rotate that around the y-axis and uh, see what we get. Um, and according to Pappus, then the volume would be the area of the blue region times 2 pi x bar. So just using the volume of a sphere, we're getting half a sphere. So the volume, just using simple geometry, is going to be 1 half times 4 thirds pi r cubed. And the area of the region is 1 fourth of the circle with radius r, so that's 1 fourth pi r squared. So we set the volume which is 2 thirds pi r cubed equal to the area which is 1 fourth pi r squared times 2 pi x bar and then we're going to just divide and it's kind of messy but we'll flip all that stuff on the on the right side next x bar over and multiply it times 2 thirds pi r cubed and when we simplify that we get 4 r over 3 pi now by symmetry or by simply rotating the region over the x-axis this time we can show that y bar is also 4r over 3 pi. Now let's look at centroids for curves. So here we have an innocent looking curve which has a point somewhere at which a pencil could balance it theoretically. Now recall that the length of the curve is given by this integral from a previous section. And so for our moment um, around the y-axis for the region, recall, we had the area times x-bar equaling the integral x f of x dx. Now, what's the difference between the region and the curve? Well, instead of using area, it makes sense that we would use the length of the curve. So let's substitute s for a, and then um, instead, of f, instead of f of x dx, which would give area, we're going to use the curve, which would just be ds. And so that's what we use for our 
uh, moment around the y-axis and to compute x-bar, then we would just take that integral and divide by the length of the curve, s. And then likewise, for our moment around the x-axis for the curve, it would be s y-bar. There's no half going on because we don't have a rectangle with length. It's just, just along the curve. So we only use the y-values. And so similarly, instead of x-bar, we have y-bar. And instead of x times ds, we have y times ds. So it's, it's really the same formula, except we're using the y-values. So here's an example. Find the centroid of the curve defined by y equal x squared from 0, 0 to 2, 4. So here's a, a little sketch of that. And here's how we find the arc length. That's our formula from a previous section. And so in this case, we're going from 0 to 2 along the x-axis, and f prime is 2x, because y is x squared, so the derivative is 2x. Now that one, you'd have to use trig, uh, trigonometric substitution to do it by hand, so I just wimped out and used my calculator. <clears throat> Here's our formula for the moment around the y-axis of c, s x bar equals the integral from a to b x ds, so in our case we would go from 0 to 2 x times uh, the square root, same thing as above, 1 plus the quantity 2 x squared, which is simplifies to 4 x squared. Now this one, this integral you could do by simple u substitution, let u equal 1 plus 4 x squared, but again I just wimped out and used the calculator because I only have an approximation for the other number anyway. And then for the moment around the x-axis of the curve, that's equal to s y bar, and uh, the integral for that is a to b y ds, so in our case we go from 0 to 2 and y is x squared, and the same square root uh, dx for ds, and that one would also be difficult to do by hand. Again, you'd have to use trig substitution. So let's just use the calculator and get an approximation. Now, finally then, x bar is the moment around the y axis divided by s, and that comes out to 1.239. And y bar is the moment around the x axis of the curve divided by s, and that comes out to approximately 1.823. And so there is our centroid. Notice that um, 1.239 is a little bit past the halfway mark along the x-axis, but 1.823 is a little bit under the halfway mark along the y-axis. Second theorem of Pappus. Let C be a curve in the plane rotated about an axis such that C does not intersect said axis. The surface area of the solid generated equals the product of the length of the curve and the distance traveled by the centroid of C. In other words, surface area equals SD. Now, if you'll recall, the first theorem said that the volume was equal to the area times D, and now we have surface area equals the arc length times D, where D is the distance traveled by the centroid. So here's a picture of that, and you'll notice that we've marked X bar, Y bar approximately in the middle of the curve. And so the distance that the centroid travels again is 2 pi x bar, because x bar is the radius of the circle. And from a previous section, we know that surface area is 2 pi times integral of x ds. Well, look, there's something familiar. That is also the moment around the y-axis for the curve, which equals, which is also equal to s x bar. So if we substitute we get surface area equals 2 pi times the integral, which is equivalent to s x bar. Rearranging that, we have s times 2 pi x bar. And what is 2 pi x bar? But the distance traveled. And so we get Pappus's second theorem. Surface area equals s d. So let's look at number 28, part A, which says to use the second theorem of Pappus to verify that the surface area of a right circular cylinder is 2 pi r h, which we've learned in geometry. So here's a typical cylinder centered um, on the y-axis. And so if we go from 0 up to h, then x bar y bar is going to be right there at a half h, um, at r comma half h. And so um, a b is the curve we're using to rotate with. So what's its length? Well, its length is just h. And the axis of rotation is the y-axis. So according to the second theorem of Pappus, the surface area equals the length of AB times the distance traveled by the centroid around the axis of rotation. 
And what 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 is that distance? Well, it just goes around the circle, right, with radius r. So the distance traveled is just 2 pi r. So the surface area is the length of the curve, which is h, times the distance traveled by the centroid, which is 2 pi r. And that, of course, is exactly what geometry told us many, many years ago, 2 pi r h. Check. Now, you may be wondering who this Pappas dude is. So I looked him up on Wikipedia, and there's precious little about him. Pappas of Alexandria, and there's the Greek for those of you who know Greek, lived from 290 to 350 AD and was one of the last great Greek mathematicians of antiquity known for his synagogy or collection and for Pappas's theorem in projective geometry. Nothing is known of his life except from his own writings, which is very little evidently, that he had a son named Hermodorus and was a teacher in Alexandria. Collection, his best known work, is a compendium of mathematics in eight volumes, the bulk of which survives. It covers a wide range of topics including geometry, recreational mathematics, doubling the cube, polygons, and polyhedra. And that's about it for our friend Mr. Pappas. And finally, here we have an athlete. Looks like maybe he's getting ready to dive or he's just touching his toes. But his centroid, or center of mass rather, since actually he doesn't have uh, the same density throughout his body, so this is actually center of mass, uh, starts out one place. And when he raises his hands, of course, he's moving some mass upwards, so the center of mass moves up a little bit. And then when he bends over, look at there, the center of mass is actually underneath him. It's not even in his body. And there you have, it's also called the center of gravity for the athlete. And of course, if you're an athlete, you have to be aware of your center of gravity all the time, right? Actually, I have no idea what I'm talking about. I am not an athlete. And I haven't even played one on TV. So enjoy this section, and uh, we'll see you next time on Multivariable Calculus.